We have over 1500 varieties, all the way up to two and a half million to three million plants that we're selling now. I think this bad greenhouse holds about 75,000 plants. I would say we probably go through millions of gallons of water. I'm Garrett Kemi, and I'm the director of growing here at Dutch Touch. We started this business roughly 30 years ago. My parents started from the ground up. We didn't start with the structure, no plants, very little knowledge of plants and we've turned it into this today. Starting off, a lot of the structure you see here was not here. We grew stuff outdoors, seasonally, on ground mat, and as time went, we started introducing ground structures, buildings, and hoop houses. I made the process a lot easier. We could hold more material and make more money off of it and get to where we are again. Now we're here. We have over 1,500 varieties nowadays. The background that my parents had, my dad was a builder, so it was pretty easy for him to throw up some structures and my mom worked for a flower shop when she was growing up. Kind of gave her the basic plant knowledge it took to get things moving. And then they both actually took college classes in agriculture. So they have some background in that as well. Over the years, as we added houses on, the quantity of plants we've grown have gone from somewhere in like the 50,000 plants range, all the way up to two and a half million to three million plants that we're selling now. The types of plants that we're growing have gone from annuals primarily and flats to pretty much everything you can think of. We're we're definitely a specialty grower. We do as much as we can here to keep our varieties up and keep people interested. We kind of try to follow the industry, keep our trends up and see what's popular. So you guys constantly adding new structures? Definitely, yeah. We added one just this last spring. It's a more specialized bay, I would say. It's for shade plants. We're doing a lot more house plants now. So we're always trying to adapt to what we grow to have a better growing area. So what's the uh, plant? So this house that we're looking at here is primarily succulents and house plants. The stuff above our heads, you can see like some jade trees. Uh, we have burrows tail baskets here. Uh, and then on the ground, we do a lot of our annual grasses. Uh, that's a very seasonal thing. One unique thing about us is we are actually year round. So unlike a lot of greenhouses in the greenhouse belts in West Michigan, we stay open year round and actually heat all of our greenhouses. So it's, it's kind of a challenge that we've had to adapt to, but it makes us unique. Why would others not be in your realm? I would definitely say that has to do with uh, the products they carry. We grow a lot of really specialized products, like the jade trees you can see. Um, and above our heads, they have to grow for multiple seasons to hit a sellable size. Can you talk about some of like, the equipment that is needed to run a green? We work with the co-op that's local and helps out all the growers to source you know, materials, plastics, machinery, things like building structures. We can go to them for about anything, which is really handy. But uh, primary things that I use in a day-to-day -day basis is uh, like vent control motors, to control in, inside temperatures. We have irrigation built in everywhere so we don't have to hand water baskets. Uh, there's hoses everywhere just for convenience. And we do have a couple more specialized pieces of technology here. We have like automated booms that actually can water over each bay. We have flooding benches, which you'll see in the back. And we do use a lot of sprinklers where we can, but I would say that's probably the basics. Can you talk about a little bit about like your day-to-day -day operations? So day to day, I would say I try to get here first. It's easier to kind of keep track of all the little tasks and remedial jobs that have to happen if you have time to plan things, because this job requires tons of planning. Without it, things get forgotten, swept under the rug a little bit, and uh, it definitely causes some chaos here and there. So I usually start my morning out planning things, assigning jobs, picking which plants need to be focused on, and then kind of tackling them one by one based on priorities, and then always watering. Obviously, you got to keep your plants alive and that's really where I would start. Moving on, we usually focus a lot on like plant maintenance. Everything's growing constantly so you know trimming things, moving things, upsizing things, hanging baskets. It all kind of happens all at once especially this time of year. What are some of like the problems that can occur on a daily basis? My job specifically, I find all sorts of problems. I do a lot of the pest management, so finding bugs on something you don't want to see bugs on is always stressful. Underwatered plants that have been forgotten that you try to save, that's that's something I deal with a lot as well. That's where keeping an eye on things is huge. Primarily pests in a commercial greenhouse is a big one. They can run rampant. 
destroy whole crops. Can you talk a little bit about like how people are buying these? Like are you guys wholesale? We're primarily a wholesaler. We do have a lot of specific vendors that we deal with. A lot of stuff gets shipped out. A lot of people come to us. Recently, we've been catering to a lot of smaller customers who come in an almost grocery style shop with us. So they'll come through and they'll pick their own trays and then they'll just make up an order and we'll check them out that way. Every once in a while, we have someone come in retail that isn't, you know, they don't have their own business. They just want some plants and we obviously don't turn them down. What do you guys get your customers? What do you guys do for advertising? So I don't really do this myself since I'm more of the grower side, but we do online advertising. We try and be a part of social media. We have an Instagram. We send out like email blasts with availabilities to everyone in our co-op. So, you know, you can get the word out on what you have because it always changes. So you want people to know primarily what plants you're offering. Do you guys do any traditional advertising? We actually don't know, which we've considered it a few times. We're just I, we're at that weird stage where we're not quite big enough to do billboards yet, but we, we probably could. Do you know how much like square footage of greenhouse you have? It's about two acres. And how many plants do you think you grow in a year? Between all the sizes, somewhere between two and three million. That is a lot. It doesn't always mean we sell two to three million plants since we are year round, but we at our biggest quantity time, I would say we're probably in that range. So this is our annuals. This is a house that seasonally is open and closed. So we actually started planting this right in the beginning of June. So it was empty before that. And between two of us, we were able to fill it this full. This is kind of what I work on a, on a day to day because they require the most care, consistent watering. These are the fancy uh, benches I was talking about. So they can actually all get watered from the bottom, which makes our job a lot easier. They just have to all get to a point where we can actually do that without overwatering. What's this plant right here? These are fiber optic grass. They're really good like potted plants. You can put them in planters as like a combo. They stay pretty manageable size. We do trim them every once in a while just to maintain them for ourselves. That is something we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis for sure. So our plants don't overwhelm us before we can ship them. I'm noticing how like these are super long rows. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, everything's actually on rollable pipes here. So you can push everything apart and walk between all the rows, which is makes it really easy too. What's uh, like the most popular plant? I would say the plants we grow the most of in here would definitely be between our Diplandenias and we're doing a lot of something called Hypoestes. So these here are pretty popular. We do quite a lot of them. We're trying out the red color this year, which I know a lot of other people grow, but we don't. So it's kind of cool for me to get in some new stuff. We're doing a bunch of flowering things, which we used to do in the past. It kind of went away and now it's coming back. So again, I'm excited about that. And then ivy is always a popular one. Stuff people put in their yards. It is a, a light perennial, I would say, which we don't grow a lot of, but that's an exception. From start to finish, how long? that process take? It really depends on the crop. So we actually time everything out based on the specific benches. So we do like an ordering in October at the end of the season for the next year. And then everything gets timed out by weeks. So say we get this plant in on week two, we want it to be done by, you know, week 16 or week 20. So ideally we have most of this stuff sold by the end of May. So it's a very short window. Say this whole row here, and it's the same plant usually here. We try to keep things similar throughout the season. So next year, if you were here, you'd probably see this here unless it performs poorly. And we do that specifically based on maybe it's the location in the greenhouse or it didn't like being next to something else. So we try and plan out which plants would grow best next to each other. It has a lot to do with like pest control and watering too. So it's easier to water things that water similarly. How many times are you growing the same plant? There are certain plants we can flip pretty quick and then replace. I would definitely say trailing stuff is really easy. You can get your own cuttings, do your own propagating. It's a way to make more money off of one crop. We do a lot of that here up in the front greenhouse. That's our propagation house. So we try as hard as we can to stretch a product. That's our shade structure. So that's all permanent shade. We specifically installed that for like a custom order. We're doing a, an order for a specific company. They wanted a lot of house plants. So we needed a better area that's more shaded to be able to grow those. Uh, it does get really hot in here in the summer, so it's not always super easy to control how much how much sun everything gets. So we made something that's a more permanent option for that. For like an average houseplant person, 
What is the best way to keep your plants alive? South facing windows, they're great. The sun goes in a big arc throughout the day typically more towards the south. So if you have a window facing on the south of your house, it'll get the most sunlight from the beginning to the end. That's usually what I suggest with any plants. House plants are a little more lenient. They don't always require as much sun. What's more important, sun or water for like a healthy plant? I'd say there's a good healthy coordination between both. If you overwater, you really need the sunshine to help you out. A lot of people, especially when it comes to succulents, they want to keep them in their house because they're super cute, but they tend to overwater because they want to overcare for their plants. So we typically say the less sun they get, the less water they need. It's not always the case, but generally. So yeah, it's kind of a handy feature. They'll water for a certain amount of time and they'll actually fill to about the right level in the bench based on the time that we pick. We kind of have it established based on our know-how of how long to run these for but it'll adequately water the plants for up to two or three days especially during the hot season then we don't have to hand water every single day how long does it take to like fill up so our small benches take about two minutes the longer ones we run for about five how many gallons of water do you think you use in a year so we actually irrigate from a pond right out back. Our pump room is in the back here. We actually filter it all, we treat it all, we add our own fertilizers. I would say we probably go through millions of gallons of water easily. We do use a special system for our benches here. It's actually renewable water. So it'll go down into a tank underneath the benches here and it'll get pumped through the wall into a big storage tank. And that just kind of cycles through. How do you know it's going to a lot of the hanging plants? The hanging baskets all run on irrigation lines through the greenhouses. It's all ran underground, again, from our pump room. There's a lot of infrastructure involved in making that work, but it's all pre-planned. Whenever we make a new structure, we have to incorporate some sort of watering irrigation system. So we use really simple irrigation controllers. Anyone who has sprinkling in their yard would probably be familiar with a lot of them. We use a ton of different brands, but it's really just like a zone controller that we've wired up to basket lines. Another cool feature of this greenhouse back here is we actually have a shade structure. This all is automatic. I have it turned off right now. Since it's nice and sunny, I kind of wanted to leave it sunny, but we can actually control how much sun this specific greenhouse gets from our shade cloth up above. Typically it's set on an automatic function with a light sensor. Whenever it gets too bright, it'll close itself a certain percentage. It's been a really useful tool. With all this equipment, how often do you guys are working on it or replacing it? We have to do seasonal checks for sure. A lot of things are bi-seasonal. So for the shade structure, I would say every spring, we do a really good maintenance on it because there's a lot of clips that fall off. And there's rips and tears that aren't always fixable. We just kind of have to work with some of those things. But a lot of the other equipment, like the benches, seasonally check. All of our basket lines, we check as we're hanging baskets. And then like pump maintenance for the main water pump is pretty important because without it, it's kind of like we can't keep the plants alive. So that's a big priority for us. So we get in an order and then it has specific numbers of what people are looking for. We'll go through, you know, we'll pull the plants, put them on racks, and then they'll either be delivered by us or they'll be picked up on a semi truck. So do you guys ship your own products? Yeah, the box truck we use a lot. It's really helpful for pickups, drop offs. We use it pretty seasonally early on, but kind of tapers off at the end of the year because a lot of people pick up their own product. What's the furthest that you guys ship your plants? Through our retail store, we go all around the country. As far as wholesale goes, we primarily sell to like Chicago. Otherwise, it's Michigan. What are some of the temperatures? How cold can it get? And what's the hottest it can do? So for any of our greenhouses that are closed during the season or after the season, this house we put down to about 34 degrees just so the water lines don't freeze. Everywhere else stays around 50 degrees, especially if it has house plants. Succulents can go a little colder, which is nice, saves us some money. I would say 50 degrees in the winter is pretty standard. In case of an outage, we do have a backup generator. It is still really scary for us because there is a lot of electrical use through the greenhouse, um, primarily our main pump. If you don't have the pump, you can't water. Circulation fans are a lot more important than most people realize. It keeps things moving. You don't get stagnant air, it keeps it cooler in here. And our vents are really important as well. Having a closed bubble in the summer, it can get up to like 120, 130 even, if you can't open your sides. Where do you guys get like your soil from? Or how does that work? So that's something we work with our co-op with. We have to kind of manage how much soil we get in at a time. Storage can be a bit of an issue in this industry between having multiple types of plastic, 
products, the soils, the soil additives, fertilizers, you know, you have to have somewhere to put it all, but you also have to have it. In the past couple of years here, it's been kind of weird, the supply chain, getting supplies. So we've been really on top of making sure we have everything we need before the season starts. Because a lot of the time you go in and they're like, oh, we don't have that. So we would have to scramble and find alternatives. 4% of the plants like, don't make it. Yeah, typically in the growing world, we say if you get like a 98% success, that's pretty good. So out of, I think this back greenhouse holds about 75,000 plants. You could expect about 750 to go from that. And that would be pretty acceptable. It's not great ever to see plants go because, you know, there's a price tag on all of them, especially from ones you don't start yourself. You have to get in liners. And then if a liner dies, there's, you know, a lot of money just going out the door. For any equipment that you guys have, are you guys making any of this stuff? or is it all outsourced? So as far as the actual material goes, the pot itself and the tray itself, we do not make any of those here. We get those all sourced in on pallets, bulk pretty much, which I could show you as well. We have a whole dirt room, we mix our own soil. I think the only thing we do that's unique over other greenhouses is we can mix our own soil, so we can add in whatever we want. A lot of places have to hand mix it or they uh, use big machines to make piles of just a basic soil. So this is the dirt room. We mix all of our own soils here. We fill all our pots here. A lot of the planning really starts here. Depending on how many plants we get in determines how much dirt we have to run. Um, we have a specific formula that we use to mix our own soils depending on water porosity and other soil blends based on fertilizing too. So the watering boom is actually really customizable. We can set it to water for about as long as we want. It has 20 adjustable speeds. We can decide which side of the boom waters depending on magnets placed on the line above. It's got a couple sensors that it uses to kind of tell where it is. It'll actually stop halfway because that's where I told it to, which is kind of cool. But generally it takes, it can run for about half an hour at a time, I would say. We don't like to do a whole lot more than that. Otherwise it causes a lot of puddling. It saves a lot of time and energy Energy, especially when you have full blocks like that, it's really hard to water the middles. So this is our propagation house. A lot of our product actually starts here. We use a lot of smaller trays where we can stick our own cuttings and propagate plants. So we actually, uh, when I say cutting, we actually go through and physically take little snips off of the plants, make little sections, and then we'll stick them in the soil. They will root and start their own plant. So that's the basics of propagation. This is a Senecio. They're a little overgrown right now. This is something we would go through right now and trim all the tips off to re-stick. So they're really just being held as stock. What's one of the most popular plants? I would say one of the most popular is probably leading towards one of our rosette style echeverias. Those are really common. They look like little roses, very popular plants. So like these cacti here, are they gonna get bigger? Like how big? A lot of these cactus were just recently stuck in the last couple months. We've been doing a new program starting from seed that takes multiple years for some varieties. Uh, others grow a lot faster, but a few of these varieties will take a lot of the sun and the energy and the water and turn into something very large over the next couple years. So we kind of have been leaning towards cactus for years now. It's just finding someone who likes to work with them isn't always easy. Thankfully, I know somebody and he came back this past year and he's been doing a great job getting poked and pricked and dealing with the cactus for us. He's very passionate about what he does and we're thankful to have him around. Can you also talk about how many employees you have? We make this all work with eight employees. Two of them are part-time, so we only have six full-time employees. Our two main hands is me and my coworker Gordon. He does all the cactus and he helps me as my right-hand man. We run all the dirt, we move all the product, we ship all the product, and then everyone else either works with the plants hands-on, doing cuttings, weeding, plant maintenance, or packing orders. What's the best temperature for cactus? Cactus can range pretty high in temperature. I don't think anything likes to grow over 90. They usually go almost in an opposite dormant state, kind of like how plants do in the winter time. They hit a point where they're just too hot and they stop growing. So optimally, we keep it between 70 and like 85 in here. That's typically pretty good for cactus. Do you know how many different types of cactus you have? I think we're around 120 different varieties of cactus. We 
aim to add one as quick as possible, really. It's like the more varieties, the more people, the more interest, so. How often do you have to water them? Cactus are a lot different than a lot of people assume. They can be watered surprisingly frequently, especially during the summer. During the winter time, we try avoiding watering them at all. They go into a dormant state where they are quite literally just paused. So watering really starts in the spring and we can water them weekly at that point. What do you think the hardest plant to grow is? A lot of house plants in a greenhouse can be really finicky. They're really picky about the water. We've tried carnivorous plants. Those are almost impossible. For anyone that can grow them, good job. And what do you think the easiest thing to grow is? Ferns are really simple. They can take it hot, they can take it cold, they like water, they can tolerate drought. Pretty awesome plant. Why Dutch Touch? So I think the business was named Dutch Touch in the past because my dad has some Dutch to him and we always thought it was kind of a catchy term to say it's the Dutch Touch when we're dealing with plants. I think that's how that all started. Why should customers come here? I think we draw in a lot of our customers based on the quality of the plants we provide. We always try to offer the best, the largest, the prettiest, the healthiest plants. And I definitely wouldn't sell anybody something that's not to my standards. Why are some of the plants on pallets? and why are some just on the ground? So you see a lot of the pallets around the greenhouse. We actually use those as an air gap between the floor. That allows for a lot of air circulation to keep things a little more dry. We don't always have the opportunity to replace our ground mat every year. So a lot of the water sits on the floors a lot worse than it would with fresh ground matting. So it's, a, it's an alternative to make sure that things stay clean, dry. And other plants that you see directly on the ground can tolerate water a lot better than others. Do you guys have any plans on expanding or growing? How do you guys plan on doing that? So in the past, we've expanded from doing one type of plant to multiple types of plants. We actually have a subsidiary even that does specifically hops for like starting beer. That's at its own location now, but as far as expanding goes now, we have about everything other than perennials. So I think that would probably be our next move is to jump into either perennials or shrubs. Why those? Perennials are typically prioritized by home growers because they don't always want to replant their yards. A lot of the times, annuals get overlooked for perennials. Perennials. So us having that as an option just increases our supply to people who want something that's lower maintenance. We used to grow a lot of plants outside. That's kind of downsized in the past year. I would say in total, when we were growing outside, it was pushing six acres of plants. Uh, now that we've split the two businesses, the acreage has moved to another location. What's the range of plants prices? So we, we try to stay competitive with our pricing. A lot of plants that do take a lot longer, like the jade trees and certain succulents that are here for years, we have to competitively price. So I could say we sell things from about $2 all the way up to about $40, depending on how long we have to hold on to it. And that's usually just wholesale. When you guys sell it like wholesale, are people buying them in like a large quantity or are they buying them in a variety quantity or is it just a mix of everything? Depending on the vendor that we're selling to, we can sell all the way up to like 16 full racks of plants at a time. That's not a ton for a business that is commercial, but we do that pretty consistently. So it ends up adding up to a lot of plants in the end. How many acres did you guys start with? The plot of land we're on now is about 14 acres of land. I think the pond takes up about one acre and then the greenhouses take up about two. So there's a lot of leftover land for potential expansion in the future. I don't know if we'd ever add too many more greenhouse structures based on how many employees we have and like to have. It just gets a little overwhelming when there's that much to keep track of. But I think we started off with less than an acre of growable space. And then it kind of just slowly increased all the way up to our two acres of indoor space that we have now. A lot of the plants we grow are actually toxic. A lot of people don't know that the house plants that they have in their home are technically dangerous. I don't expect anyone to go eating their own plants, but it's always something that I try and educate people on, whether they're buying something that's pet safe, not pet safe. You don't want your dog eating one of your plants and getting sick. It's not always a huge concern, but it's good knowledge to have. Something that I deal with a lot is dealing with customers who are concerned about spray. There's a lot of misconception about insecticides, fungicides, what you should and what you shouldn't use. Is it safe to have this plant in my house afterwards? Something that everyone should know about that is we are all uh, registered and we have licenses to be able to spray things like that on plants. We're very mindful of how much we spray just to keep bug populations down. We obviously don't want to sell a plant that is infested with something that could ruin someone's entire like collection. But there's this negative stigma behind
behind it that people just need to realize that we're keeping this under control so we can keep our business going. During like cool up time, do you guys make any cool ups and things like that? Uh, we're one of the few businesses in the greenhouse industry that doesn't fall into the seasonal loops of tulip time or doing mums or combo baskets. We do know a lot of other growers that are in that, but that's something we've phased out entirely. What are three tips of advice for other people that want to start a business? I mean, for anyone that's looking to start a business in general, I think they should know their market for sure, know where they stand in the market. We've kind of branded ourselves, so a lot of people know what we have to offer, and I feel like that's been really Really helpful knowing what you're going to sell is huge so like you don't want to pick a product or something you're not passionate about so if if you're interested in plants obviously the greenhouse thing is great we have a lot of people that love plants that don't want to grow the plants but they just want to be able to source the plants so that's a whole nother option and then I would say knowing how much labor is involved is pretty big too. I didn't realize it growing up, how much work it actually was until I got into it myself. It's very tedious growing plants. You have to be on top of everything and there can be a lot of disasters involved. So I think really knowing what you're getting into is important.